good afternoon. Uh, we're all here today to outline another important step with our all-in efforts to improve our waterways. As you may recall, in April, we officially launched the Vermont Invasion Phosphorus Challenge, or VPIC, at the Vermont Farm Show. This initiative is a new way of tackling a very challenging issue, looking for solutions to reduce phosphorus in our lakes and streams. The problem we face is balance. We have more phosphorus going into our watersheds than we can take out, resulting in the excess of phosphorus in our environment. Currently, we're focused most of our efforts on just one end of the issue, working to address runoff on our, in our waterways. And this must continue because we have farmers engaged, working with our regulators to tackle this issue, and we've seen some progress. BPIC is seeking proactive solutions rather than relying only on reactive efforts. This is a new way of thinking about phosphorus and a new opportunity to solve our nutrient issues by removing phosphorus from the land before it reaches our waters. With the help of talented working group made up of scientists, business leaders, engineers, academics, and our team with the agencies of agriculture, natural resources, and commerce, we're now prepared to help move projects from concept to prototype. In just a few moments, we'll outline six proposals receiving state funding. The truth is, it was a very difficult selection pro process with more than 25 proposals submitted and a strong showing from Vermont-based entities. This impressive re response shows the spirit of innovation in Vermont and those willing to try to solve one of our most difficult environmental challenges. This proves there's potential to reduce phosphorus loading to Vermont's landscape and waterways through innovative technologies and creating opportunities for new products as well. Just to be clear, the VPIC challenge is in addition to ongoing measures being used and best management practices implemented by farmers and municipalities. These land-based practices will continue to receive funding. The VPIC approach is a new way to think about and address excess phosphorus. We have to acknowledge phosphorus is still needed and it's valuable, but too much creates issues. By working with the private sector, this challenge is a win-win-win. It combines science, technology, and innovation. It creates a new model around phosphorus by promoting economic growth, environmental sustainability, and societal benefits. On behalf of my team, I want to thank those who participated in this challenge for your innovative ideas and commitment to helping address this complex problem. Secretary of Commerce Mike Sherling will now share more on this reverse pitch approach. Secretary Sherling. Uh, I think my role is to sort of outline what's different about this. The, uh, the reverse pitch is, a, is the inverse of the way uh, government typically does things. I'll observe that in the last year, I've been to a couple of different events kicking off things that were envisioned before I was born. This started in April and it's coming to fruition in October. That's what's different about the approach. It's a much more entrepreneurial uh, way of approaching problem solving, something that the private sector and small business in particular has embraced for some time. Traditionally, government puts out hundreds of pages of documents pre-prescribing a solution to a problem that we have uh, identified. This is different because what we have done is put out on the street the problem and asked scientists, entrepreneurs, and innovators to come forward with their ideas for potential solutions and are embracing multiple potential solutions instead of just going down one road, which is the typical way that government responds to problems. So we're hopeful that this, um, one of the things that uh, we've already noted is that the size of the organizations, the companies uh, and partnerships that are being funded here is not the typical size uh, of the organizations that typically get government funding. Usually you need uh, an entire department that responds to requests for proposals in order to even respond to something that we put out. Uh, that's not the case here. Uh, very short proposals were initially uh, submitted Science then backed that up, and then we had an interactive process where there were presentations and question and answer period by uh, a dozen or more uh, 
correspondence to the uh, original set of proposals. So uh, a much more nimble approach, a uh, one that casts a much wider net for small and medium-sized organizations and companies to respond to, and hopefully at the end of this process we'll have uh, netted faster and uh, more nimble and more affordable results for Vermonters as well. Secretary Tetz, I believe is next yeah. if I can find the director yeah. behind <laughs> Thank you very much, um, Anson Tebbets for the uh, Agency of Agriculture. Um, this is the part where we are going to uh, announce the six recipients. Uh, four out of the six are with us. Uh, we want to thank the, uh, the governor for challenging uh, state government to think differently about issues. I also want to thank the evaluation team made up of scientists uh, and uh, people in business and folks in state government as well. And a special thank you to uh, Caitlin Hayes. Caitlin with the Agency of Agriculture. Where's Caitlin? There's Caitlin over there. Caitlin is the uh, project manager on this. Uh, could not be done without her. Also, I think we have one member from the uh, evaluation team. Eric is here from the Lake Champlain uh, Basin Program. He was on the uh, evaluation team as well. So, Governor, if you could sign the first uh, check here. Um, we are going to the first uh, recipient uh, for $45,000 is DVO. Uh, this is the University of Vermont. This is a project that involves 13 anaerobic digester vessels situated statewide to be utilized with enhancements of solids control using dissolved air flotation and develop a pea cake, a pea cake product that is high in phosphorus for, for potential nationwide resale that will have be verified and significant value to agriculture. So congratulations to DVO and the University of Vermont. Uh, one of the recipients that could not be here today is from Enosburg Falls, uh, which is uh, AgriLab Technologies. Uh, their project involves the use of a combination of existing phosphorus recovery technologies, composting, and drying equipment and associated best management practices to demonstrate the technical feasibility of stabilizing and added value to recovered pea cake and similar materials. So AgriLab uh, was awarded $50,000. Our next recipient um, that is here uh, comes from uh, Vermont, Bridport, uh, working with uh, Rock Dust. They are going to manufacture, apply, and study mineral and mineralized biocarbon soil amendments, or it's called biochar. It will be deployed in the field to manage solution, reactive phosphorus, and nitrogen loss through broadcast field applications, animal bedding admixtures, and filtration media. So congratulations to Rock Dust. They are here with us, and they have been awarded $25,000 to go forward with the next project there, so Rock Dust. Uh, Digested Organics uh, could not be with us. Uh, they have been awarded $45,000 uh, using an ultra filtration system on a Vermont dairy farm to remove most of the present phosphorus, suspended solids, and pathogens in liquid manure, producing a transparent liquid ideal for field application known as permeate or tea water and a concentrated fertilizer that is readily transportable known as UF concentrate. So they are going to be awarded $40,000, but are not here. Our next recipient comes from the uh, village of Essex Junction in the Chittenden County Solid Waste District and UVM. In this, for $45,000, the use of proprietary pipe descaling technology to remove phosphorus in Vermont-sized wastewater applications. Uh, this technology will use induced electric field of amplitude and frequency that can promote uh, precipitation of crystalline minerals uh, without the dangerous and damaging adhesion to pipes, pumps, or in tanks. So congratulations to the uh, village of Essex, Chittenden County Solid Waste District, and UVM, $45,000. They're here. And our final uh, recipient comes from the Northeast Kingdom, uh, Green State Biochar, uh, with uh, $30,000. Uh, 
they will be using uh, local renewable organic waste materials that are processed in an innovative machine developed in Vermont as a prototype machine that produces carbon product called biochar. This phosphorus capture system utilizes this biochar to act as a filter that efficiently captures the majority of the phosphorus while producing valuable soil amendment fertilizer products for local reuse. So congratulations to Green State Biochar uh, from Barton. Outstanding. Um, uh, many thanks to all our companies, our researchers, our scientists for stepping up and working on this uh, difficult issue. Uh, we believe in you, uh, we believe in your work, and we look forward to seeing your projects uh, progressing along the way. To talk about the next steps, I'll introduce uh, Secretary of Natural Resources, Julie Moore. <coughs> Good afternoon. So I thought I'd just say a few words about um, where, where we're headed to following today. So as the previous speakers have noted, stage two involves a total of $250,000 of funding um, allocated to these projects for prototyping, business case development, and demonstrations of the proposed technology over the next several months. Uh, individual proposals contain a range of activities, things like pilot treatments, bringing a demonstration unit onto, of a particular technology onto a Vermont farm and running it for a period of time, grow tests, developing mixes that use the recovered phosphorus and to do identify the best mix in promoting plant growth, um, and field demonstrations with monitoring. So the range of stage two work is really reflective of the different types of projects that are being pursued, but all of this work is essential in making informed decisions about what approaches make sense to adva advance to full-scale implementation. Over the next several weeks, a team will be negotiating project-specific scope of work and timeline for each of these successful proposals, and we expect that the work may take up to 12 months to complete. Beyond that, stage three selections will focus primarily on the estimated cost per pound of phosphorus mitigated, as well as the way the demonstrated approach will allow that captured phosphorus to be repurposed as part of a value-added product. We don't believe that there's a singular solution to the phosphorus challenges Vermont faces, but rather a toolbox, and are just completely thrilled by the range of tools that were submitted to VPIC for our consideration. And with that, I'm happy to open it up to questions. Can somebody just say in layman's terms what these things mean? What what are they actually doing? <laughs> sure, there's a whole a whole different range of, of technologies, um, but at the end of the day, it's trying to extract phosphorus from a waste stream before that waste is is ultimately land applied or before it reaches a surface water. So some of these materials, the biochar material, for example, um, have a real affinity for phosphorus, and the, the thinking is they, in the rock dust material, and they, that you should be able to bind that and keep it on site. Um, others of these processes are looking to actually scavenge that phosphorus out um, before it ever reaches the environment. So pre-treating um, manure or municipal biosolids that would otherwise be land applied and reducing the phosphorus concentration in them. Does that? Oh, yeah, perfect. Okay. So does, do all of these recipients become part of stage three or not necessarily so? Uh, the vision is that two to three of them would be selected for stage three, but we haven't made any firm decisions on that in large part because we're going to wait and see what the results show us. Uh, we don't want to overcommit if, if for some reason things need more work, and we don't want to undercommit if we feel like the opportunities are really viable. And how much funding goes towards that? Part? Again, we're going to wait and, and see what the results of stage two yield. And if I'm understanding the timeline correctly, you said um, from now and for about 12 months, you're estimating things to kind of play out before implement the prototypes, and then after that 12 months, how long should we, when, when should we expect a stage three decision? I, I think in fairly short order, assuming there are things that look like they're, they're really ready to move into that full-scale implementation, our, our hope is to move aggressively with this. Uh, as the governor noted in his remarks, we, we face a significant phosphorus imbalance here in Vermont on the order of 1,500 tons a year. 
Um, and so the sooner we can get at reducing that imbalance and trying to get back to closer to, to zero, a zero sum game where we're using um, the same amount of phosphorus or bringing the same amount of phosphorus into Vermont that we're exporting in, in agricultural products, um, ultimately the better it will be for the water environment. So none of these, none of these would address the phosphorus that's already in the waterways or in the lakes. Is that right? Not, not directly, although the, the treatment um, designs that both rock dust um, and the Green State Biochar are proposing could be potentially used as a, an edge of field treatment um, to address phosphorus losses that are coming off of the land. Are any of these things already happening anywhere? Um, some are, some aren't. Uh, I think there's some pretty innovative pieces that have been proposed here. Um, there are some applications, and, and frankly, we, we shied away from a number of them where, where they were either well under development or um, had other funding that was essentially intending to, to do the same work um, that we were hoping to, to catalyze through the Phosphorus Innovation Challenge. Um, so we've been, been fairly selective in picking things that we believe have direct application here in Vermont, and we want to prove out that by having the work done on the ground here in state. Some of these are private companies, some of these are municipalities, uh, educational institutions. Does the state retain any ownership of these things moving forward, or is it just turning over the cash <clears throat> to them, and then whatever comes of it, comes of it? Mike, if you're able to. Sure. Uh, the, the, those are things that we'll figure out once we determine what's viable and what the economic modeling is. Um, Cost-benefit analysis, what does it cost to deploy, how scalable is it, and then there are a variety of different ways that uh, the, the deal structures could be um, could be established, but we don't have them yet, so we haven't reached that point. Kind of related to that, is it up to the individual companies to, sh to show that there's a potential market for this, or is the state as a whole kind of figuring out where markets might be? In part, one of the things that we anticipate evaluating to move to the next phase is the scalability or the viability of the business model to sustain itself, not just the technology. So you may have a, a perfect piece of technology, but the cost to run it and the uh, ability to deploy it on a wide scale don't necessarily match. So um, there's a host of factors and a, a number of different variables. And again. One of the things that makes us different is we haven't pre-prescribed all of these nuances at the front end. Uh, it's a very iterative approach. So uh, it gives the state and the taxpayers and the respondents and the folks getting grants uh, a variety of flexibility at the back end to try to come together to find the, to both select the best solutions and then create the best uh, individual relationships to move things forward. So is, it, is it possible that the state could get into the phosphorus capturing business? We'd probably be remiss if we ever said absolutely not. Um, I don't think that's something we necessarily envision. That's why we've asked others to respond. But uh, I guess it depends uh, how things play out in the next uh, year or so. How did these different technologies, or I should say, did these different technologies as they were applying, how did they, everybody's proved that they all work. Is that fair to say? even on a small scale, or, or are some of these projects still in the theory phase? I, I think each project is able to make some demonstration of, of applicability. So we have confidence that, it, that it's appropriate to, to move it forward. None of them are, I, you know, in my mind, I call it sort of the crazy guy in his basement, right, where, where they have an idea, but they haven't actually formed it into a, a, a product. Um, you know, the, the biochar folks, for example, brought us a sample of their, their biochar. Rock dust brought us a sample of, of their actual physical material and a, a clear description of how those would be incorporated into their design. So we have confidence that, that all of them are at the stage where it's, it's really putting them on the ground and seeing how they function in the environment, um, even at a, a pilot scale that's really the es essential to answering those questions. Those folks in the basement are called visionary innovators. <laughs> visionary Visionary innovator. I saw that there was a smile on a lot of their faces. I'd love to see a novelty check that said crazy guy in base. There's probably a t-shirt already. Now all these all these are addressing sort of point source uh, sources of phosphorus. A lot of our pro a lot of our problem with phosphorus is non-point source. Uh, you know, how, 
how much of our problem can these things address? So um, I would say actually this really is, is essential to getting at, at non-point source phosphorus. One of the things we know from research that's been done is that there is a strong relationship between how much phosphorus there is in the soil and how much phosphorus is lost as a result of non-point source pollution. So to the extent that we're able to, to scavenge some of that soil phosphorus or scavenge it from materials before they're applied to the land, um, we are addressing non-point source pollution. And so I, I think this represents a really exciting opportunity to get to what is, you're correct, is 95% of the, the problem when it comes to phosphorus pollution here in Vermont. You've also got in Vermont, like some of these things uh, have to do with farms, and we have a lot of farms. Uh, how feasible is it to put s some sort of phosphorus capturing mechanism on enough farms to make it? So um, one of the, the entities that, that we're, we've made an award to today, DVO, is operating digesters on 13 farms. But I believe those 13 farms, Anson, represent 20,000 cows or upwards of 20,000 cows. Um, so we're able to have a disproportionate impact on sort of the total herd um, here in Vermont by, by working through that outfit, which was part of what, what appealed to us, frankly. Um, and then we have some smaller scale technologies that, that are, are more may be applicable to, to particular critical source areas, places where we have a, a significant phosphorus concentration in, in close proximity to a surface water body. Um, so we've tried to pick a mix of technologies to, to get, a, get a, the full range of conditions we see here in Vermont. What, what does biochar look like? Do you have an example of it? Okay, so come on, explain it what it is. It's, it's just charcoal. <laughs> Can, so, do you mind, do you mind well, just explaining what it is and how it works? <laughs> Let's stay up here with you. <laughs> Thank God. Come back to that your basement <laughs> I was afraid of that. Everybody looked in our direction. Um, it's just wood with everything gone out of it but the carbon. The so, process that can't get oxygen in the process, and that's what makes it a nice, light charcoal. So it looks like charcoal. It is charcoal. Correct. Um, and then phosphorus binds to it. Is that? Mm -hmm. it's, it's very porous. So there's lots of pores in that biochar. So when the runoff is going through it, the um, biochar is ab uh, absorbing all the phosphorus. Like a sponge? Yes, exactly. And so this would be applied to agricultural fields? Well, now you have this biochar-enriched product, which is with the phosphorus. And yes, it can be used on a multitude of uh, applications. It, it would be. Um, right now, we have a lot of people interested in once it's absorbed all of its phosphorus. Um, hemp is getting to be a big thing up yeah. my way. We've been contacted by a lot of hemp farmers yes. that are interested in that product as so well. So you, you apply it in some way to a field, but then you have to go back out and get it? Yes, yeah, no, it's well, basically applied like a filter, like your household charcoal filter. It's the same idea. But then you're putting it on the ground. It wouldn't go back yet. Then it becomes a fertilizer on the ground. So now you put back fertilizer that you've captured. So you're reusing fertilizer. So everything you lost, you still have. Right. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. Can, I get your, can we get your names? This is Roger Pion, Luke Persons, and I'm Donna Pion. I just want Pion. P I O N. Thank you. I guess that, that brings me to a question. I'm not sure who it's for. Maybe uh, maybe Secretary Shirley. Um, there's a lot of phosphorus out there, uh, and the challenge. I, I would think the challenge is as much finding markets as it is developing technology. You know, are there markets out there? Uh, it, it, you're right. That is one way to look at the the challenge. We we haven't uh, narrowed the focus of success just to uh, finding a marketable solution. <coughs> the the first challenge is. And how do we positively impact the surplus of phosphorus that we're putting into the watershed on an annual basis? So sort of like first get to zero while we're simultaneously trying to clean up what's there. Um, so that is a measure of success. The marketing this is the extra special bonus. We can positively impact the problem and at the same time create a, um, a set of businesses that thrive in Vermont, create jobs, create revenue, and uh, recycle the phosphorus or do something else with the byproduct, that's the extra special bonus. Um, 
one of the things I mentioned at a, one of the earlier press conferences is not the sort of lay person in all of this from a scientific and agricultural perspective. It was interesting to me to, to find out that I knew that phosphorus was essential to growth of everything on the planet, but there is a finite amount of phosphorus. And one of the things I learned was as it makes its way to the ocean, it's lost. So at some point, the planet will run out of phosphorus. We have no idea when that's going to be, and in part because some of the biggest uh, suppliers of phosphorus in other countries don't uh, let on how much they have in their reserves. Um, but so recycling it actually becomes an eventual imperative uh, for the planet. Uh, you know, that's something. We'll all be gone by that point, but we might as well start thinking about that as a piece of the puzzle as well. So, Governor, um, you had said that this phosphorus capture needs to be done in conjunction with existing, you know, ongoing water quality efforts. So, based off of that, do you? Um, well, I'd be curious what your proposal is for long term. Well, we're going to continue along the same path that we're working on right now. Uh, there are a number of initiatives that we're, we put forth, uh, as you know, over the last two years. We've had a 70 percent increase in the number of those projects uh, that are being implemented, again, as we speak. Um, so uh, Julie uh, probably could give us a, a few examples of that, but one that comes to mind is uh, the eventual uh, lake aeration uh, of uh, Lake Carmai. Uh, focusing on that, and then there's other uh, initiatives that we're uh, that are really capital projects that are being being utilized right now. Okay, I sort of meant more um, the long-term clean water funding is still has been a question for the past couple of years. So I was curious. Well, again, I've is. committed uh, to that long-term uh, funding. We're going to come up with a source. I'm looking at existing uh, sources right now, mm -hmm. ongoing, uh, and I'm not uh, ready. Uh, at this point uh, to uh, divulge that. We're right in the middle of campaign season, uh, and I'm afraid uh, that anything that I propose at this point uh, might not be well received uh, for all kinds of different reasons, as you might expect. Uh, so I'd rather get through the election, uh, and then let's work at this together uh, so that we have a viable source. On, that the I other, think is a, is on the other hand, it's, I have a secret plan. That's not a secret plan. I mean, I've said uh, that I'm going to be looking within the budget uh, to utilize an existing uh, tax structure uh, because I don't believe that we have to raise another tax. Uh, I've been pretty clear on that, and I think there's uh, examples we, we could, uh, we're looking at the, the fundamentals and making sure that this is going to be viable, uh, but I don't want to propose something uh, that just gets uh, shot down out of hand uh, either because it's too important. Okay, that's about wraps it up. <laughs> <laughs> this, is the, this is the point of the press conference where you might not want to answer some of the questions. Be, be behind me when some of the questions come up. So, uh, feel free if you'd like to stay, fine. Uh, and, uh, but pick up your check on the way. <laughs> <laughs> What's your reaction to the ethics commission's ruling this week? I was um, disappointed, uh, to tell you the truth, uh, from a number of different perspectives. Uh, first of all. Uh, that uh, I'd offered uh, to come before them, offered any uh, information they might need to arrive at whatever decision they were going to make, but I thought it was important uh, that they understood the issue uh, and what we, what steps we've taken and so forth, so they had a, a good background uh, from that perspective. Uh, they rejected that or didn't, uh, didn't respond uh, whatsoever. Uh, secondly, uh, that <laughs> I, I felt as though uh, from a courtesy standpoint, uh, that before I had to read it in the media, uh, that they might uh, reach out and let me know what their decision was. Uh, so I was disappointed on a couple of different uh, levels. Um, I still believe uh, that uh, this has been litigated a couple of times, uh, once during two years ago, during about this time during an election. Uh, I made the commitment to sell my share of the business. Uh, I, in January, after being uh, sworn in, I had a press conference, had many of you here today at the press conference, and was fully transparent and showed everyone what uh, had transpired, why, I, what I was going to do. Uh, so I have, there's nothing uh, that hasn't been laid out. And, uh, and so uh, now we're litigating it again for a third time uh, at the 11th hour, uh, kind of an October surprise 
during an election year. What mm -hmm. information did you offer to provide them? Anything they wanted. Assistance? And they rejected? They didn't ever respond. So the, the commission says they don't have the authority to do that. Is this, is this I, I, I gave them, I gave, them the, I gave them the authority. I said, I have all the information. At, at least listen to what I have to say, uh, and I will make it available to you. But their statutory authority says they can't investigate, which means that's, they, that's, all they can do that's, is that's a ridiculous, ridiculous but statement. Isn't it, so isn't it fundamentally just a broken thing? No, it, it's not. Be, I mean, that's the way we do things in Vermont. You know, if you want information, you at least ask for it. I mean, if somebody's they offered, they they can't. If so, but I offered it to them. They don't have the right to subpoena me, but if I'm offering it to them, then I don't understand what the problem is. So my understanding is this, the statutory, the statute that created the commission says they can't investigate. They can essentially accept a complaint and look at that complaint and weigh in on that complaint without, they don't have the authority to look at what you're offering. Oh, which, which is why I, I'm saying, I, isn't I, it broken? Shouldn't we give them the authority to actually look at all I think they could have taken that. So you don't, but we shouldn't change the commission structure? I, I'm not saying that because I think it's fraught with danger. I think, think about the implications of this. If that's the case, when you have a complaint, and all you have to do is make the complaint, and the, and the next day the headlines are someone is unethical, uh, think about the, uh, the what, what's going to happen to politics in Vermont. But that's as a what's happening now. I, I, believe me, I'm living it. So yeah, no, this is fraught with danger, and it's going to it's it's going to be utilized by all sides. This isn't going to be one party. It's just. So we should kill the commission. No, no, I think you should improve it. Huh. I mean, How do you improve it without listen, expanding Listen, they're, they're the ones that came up with this. I think they'll understand, uh, the legislature will understand uh, this uh, isn't exactly the way they had thought this thing through, and, and I believe they'll change it. How do you think it needs to be changed? Its structure and its powers? I, listen, I'm going to let the legislature work on this. This was their idea, their concept. Uh, they worked on it for a number of years. And uh, I think they'll continue to work on it. But at the very least, you, you had information you wanted them to review. They didn't. So is that a good place to start with? Maybe well, restructure? again, I think the commission, as it exists today, could hear this, at least hear me out, and or listen to anybody that I've offered anything they need. But at this point, I'm not sure it matters. Do you see their argument that there's a possible appearance of conflict here? And if so, do you find that to be an issue? Um, again, this is a fully transparent process. I take the unprecedented step of stepping away from my business, selling my business, as I promised to do. I believe that with the process we have, with contracting in Vermont, everything is transparent. Everything is bid. Anyone can see the results of those bids. I don't understand. I personally don't don't understand it, but I accept their findings. I mean, based on the complaint, if that's all it takes is a complaint, um, we'll see what happens in the this, future. This isn't the usual like the usual political argument that we see in Vermont. It's it's talking about ethics. It's talking about integrity. It's talking about you as a person. Essentially, is this different for you? Well, again, it seems suspect to me uh, that a powerful political organization makes a complaint uh, during October of an election year. So it's well, they, they made the complaint in, I believe, in August after the Ethics Commission adopted, it, adopted its ethics code in June or July. Um, after the code, after the election? They, well, they, they, they couldn't make the complaint until the Ethics Commission had a code. Right, and the, and the code that they adopted was after the election, correct? They, they adopted the code in, what, this summer? Right. You're saying it doesn't take effect until after no, the election? No, I'm, I'm just saying uh, that this is a, a new code that right. they came up with on their own. I don't. I think it went through any uh, rules process. I don't believe it was there was any uh, oversight by the legislature. This is something they came up with. A rogue commission? I think uh, there's room for improvement. Um, Senate moved forward with the confirmation of Judge Kavanaugh today. 
there'll be a vote sometime this weekend. Um, should he serve on the court at this point? The vote's coming. Should he serve? Well, again, uh, from my perspective, I've said all along that they should take as long as they need to uh, to make sure this is a lifelong appointment. Uh, they should take all the time they need to make sure that they're, uh, uh, they feel this is a, 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 good, uh, a good process. They have the information to arrive at the decision they need to make. Uh, I think, again, uh, seeing the polarization we're seeing throughout our country and the partisanship that ex obviously exists and the close balance uh, uh, in terms of numbers, um, I believe the process uh, needs to change. I believe that they should adopt our uh, process here in Vermont. Uh, I sat on the Judicial Nominating Committee uh, for a couple of years, two or three years. It is a membership of uh, both parties. Uh, Senate, House, uh, Vermont Bar Association has three members, uh, two at large, and we sit uh, for uh, a week or two weeks uh, going over applications, fully vetting uh, those who are seeking uh, judiciary uh, uh, appointments. And uh, so at that point, they conclude, they, they forward names to the governor, and you pick from that list of names, fully vetted by a bipartisan commission. That seems like a better process than what we have right now in Washington. I think they should consider changing that. Did they take the appropriate time to figure this out? I mean, there's going to be. It doesn't appear time. that they did. I mean, there's there's complaints on both sides, and in, in, in some respects, that's almost immaterial. But because if you if you come to the conclusion that it's it's such a close balance of power there, uh, and obviously there's going to be many people who aren't happy with the decision either way. So um, it's it's unfortunate it came to this. Will you be happy with Justice Kavanaugh? I would be happy with a fairer process uh, that fully vets uh, the candidates. And uh, I, I would be happier if there was a bipartisan uh, nominee that came forward uh, and, and it was done on a bipartisan basis. I mean, this is just too important. Did you, did you support Justice uh, Gorsuch? I wasn't in the Senate at that time. No, but I mean, <laughs> was, that, was he somebody that you thought was a, was a good pick that should serve on the court? I, I, listen, I didn't follow it, uh, but obviously, uh, again, it had a process. I don't even know what the vote was, uh, whether it was a bipartisan vote. I, I just don't know. I don't remember. If, if Judge Kavanaugh was going through a more open Vermont process, he's not, but, it, but based on your experience of, of the Vermont process, do you think he would have gotten through? I mean, it's, it's yeah. you're saying that Washington should adopt a process similar to Vermont, or at least consider it. If so, would, would we be where we are now? I, I have no idea. I just know uh, that the process we take in Vermont, uh, there, it's, it's a rigorous process. You fully vet the candidates, and it's done in a bipartisan way. And I think that's what the important part is that the names are agreed upon, just like um, the Green Mountain Care Board. They're, they're agreed upon by a committee. So then they're forwarded. So this it takes out the partisanship. So do you think this process was unfair? I think it's become unfair because of the polarization and partisanship we're seeing in Washington. So I don't think it's working anymore. What? What do we know so far about the foliage season in terms of? <laughs> it's here. I, mean, do we, I don't know how early do you get indications of whether they're leaving their money here. The, uh, oh, okay, that's what you're getting. I was, I was looking at the trees. They're changing. He's, he's all we, about we the We likely cash. have a weekly uh, update, but why not? We, we likely have a weekly update, but I don't have it with me. We get them on an ongoing basis. No, I, I didn't anticipate that particular question. So. <laughs> you got me. Where's the money? <laughs> but it appears. I mean, we've had, you know, we've had a, a challenging week in terms of uh, much-needed rain, uh, but it's going to be beautiful for the next week or so. And we haven't hit peak foliage uh, in all parts of Vermont. Uh, I think it looks positive. <laughs> I mean, it looks like people are traveling. Uh, so I, I think it's it sounds good. Yeah, 
Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.